My name is Eric Gilbert and I live here in Victoria by the Sea. My family runs the Island Chocolates Company and we've been doing that since 1987. I was 11 when my folks opened the shop and my sister and I have kind of taken the lead now and my folks are stepping back. Victoria by the Sea is a really unique and beautiful place on the south shore of Prince Edward Island. Um, it has a lot of rich history. It was a major commercial hub um, going back a hundred years more. There used to be a ferry from Charlottetown to here. They used to ship uh, agricultural products from Prince Edward Island to the West Indies on schooners, triple-masted schooners out of this harbour. And there's a lot of tourism now. There's a lot of artists and uh, craftspeople. There are potters and painters and jewellers. So it's still a working harbour. There's fishermen. They, they go mostly for lobster, also crabs, scallops. Um, and then there's the pleasure boaters. But it's also very seasonal as well. So we have about 120 year-round residents. And in the summer, that number doubles, maybe triples, and we get thousands of visitors a day. And that comes with, with certain pressures as well, like parking, traffic, things like that. But we manage it fairly well, and we're in the middle of, as a community, doing our um, Victoria Vision 2035, like a plan for the future of how we're going to manage these things and what kind of future we want for ourselves. We face a lot of challenges here in Victoria, and development is, is one of them. Um, things change and, and, and move forward, but we also want to preserve the heritage of this community. We also want to make it uh, livable for the people who actually live here. And so for three months of the year, we're really busy and there's a lot of people here. And so we have to look at things as we plan for the future of how we're going to manage all of that. And so in terms of parking, in terms of congestion, in terms of what types of businesses we want here, we don't want this to just become completely commercialized and hollowed out. Um, so we encourage owner-operated independent businesses. We discourage chains and, and franchises. We want it to be a real place rather than just a place that people come and visit. Our community, Victoria by the Sea, we face significant challenges related to environmental issues and to climate change. Our bay when I was a kid, you could, and many people did, would just walk along the shore and eat oysters right off the shore with a bottle of hot sauce in your pocket. And that hasn't been able to happen for a long time because of high nitrate levels, agricultural chemical runoff, a uh, sewage lagoon upriver from us. So the bay is contaminated and that's a huge problem. Um, we also, installed a causeway in the early 60s and that changed the flow of water and so you see major accretion just over here by the newer wharf. So the harbour is filling in and filling in and we dredge it regularly and it's always a battle to find the funding to do that. Um, historically there was a ferry from Charlottetown that came here. There were big ships, deep water, deep keeled ships that would come right here to this harbour and now there's three feet of water here and it's completely filled in. So that's not happening. The channel has changed out there. There used to be two buoys. Now there's half a dozen or more because the channel is tightening, tightening and turning. And so when they put the causeway in, the local fishermen kept telling them, bring the bridge closer, make the opening closer to this side. And they didn't do that. And so it changed the course of the water and uh, we don't know for sure, but a lot of people feel that that's what's causing a lot of the infill of our harbor. You'd never get a large ship in here now. And people have been rescued off these sandbars out here numerous times. And so just more recently, this summer, we dredged it again. And they've been putting up the gabions, which are the cages full of rocks, to, to fight erosion along the causeway. So it just seems like they keep doubling down and putting all significant funds into measures that aren't long term. I mean this is not the first time that those caged rocks have just disintegrated. And then if you go a little further we have the um, Halibut PEI and they have a fortified shoreline there and if you go past that there's the park which has n no protection and it's disappearing faster than ever. I think this last year has been the worst in a long time. The caretaker of the park, uh, Alan Marshall, he documents the distance from the building to the shore and it's just going so quickly. You can you can really see just gabions, fortified, nothing, 
and then more fortification at the cottages and the park is disappearing. That building will not be there much longer at all. So these are some of the issues that we're, we're dealing with just in, in terms of infrastructure, erosion, the quality of, of the environment, like the health of the environment of the bay is a concern. And also it's busy, you got, you got a lot of tourists here, you got uh, the fishermen coming and going. Um, and also the wharves are uh, federally owned and so you have multiple levels of governance who nobody wants to pay the bill for any of this stuff. So this seawall that you see right here, it took 20 years to get them to address this and everyone was like, well, it's a provincial thing or it's a municipal thing or it's a federal thing. And it was, it was everybody was like, I can't pay for that. So it took a lot of work and a lot of organizing and we're a small community. So it's difficult to, to form all these committees and, and do these things that often take years, but we're, happy to do it because we care about that sound. So we're standing here in Victoria next to the seawall and we're surrounded by beautiful heritage buildings and if you take a look at these buildings, the one on my left here, it used to be the customs house. So you'd have ships going to the West Indies and back and this was the customs house. There was a dance hall upstairs, there was a general store, there was a lot of action going on here. And this building was actually lived in until fairly recently. Um, our last remaining um, World War II veteran lived there. Her name was Lillian. And she was really quite a lady in our community. And she wasn't going to move out of her house. And so the seawall that this replaced completely disintegrated. The water was going right into the street. And twice as on the fire department, we went in there during storm surges and she was in her bed and the water was knee deep in her house and we took her out of there and we took her right across the street to another heritage building called the Eureka House, which used to be a boarding house for many years in, in the earlier days and is now a, a residence. And so you can also see that, you know, that building is falling apart and without help, we're going to lose some of these heritage properties. but. It was quite a night when it was storming and we're knee deep in her living room trying to get her out of her own house and she didn't want to leave. She, I mean, she wanted to leave that night, but generally speaking, people were like, hey, we could find you another place in the community. You wouldn't have to leave the community. She's like, no, I'm staying here. This is my home. Well, Victoria by the Sea is, it's so picturesque. It's so beautiful. The setting is so nice that we end up you know in a lot of magazines we end up on the news people come here and and instagram is just going crazy and so people the numbers of tourists have been increasing and increasing and and that's great for business but it's also a concern of of how to how to manage all of this so that people come and have a good experience but the locals can still have a quality of life and we're not overwhelmed this year was pretty much a drought we got very little rain this year, so there was lots of people, the beaches were full, and I mean, it's just so beautiful here that, that people want to come here, and it's, and it's nice. So it needs to be protected, and development needs to be guided in a way that is beneficial for everybody and doesn't cause any detriments to the environment or to the quality of life of the residents. Looking towards the future, I want to see a community that is healthy and vibrant and strong, um, I want people to be able to make a living here and to be able to raise their families here in a safe and healthy environment. I grew up here as a kid and, and it was a fabulous place to grow up. Um, I have concerns about, about the deterioration of, of the environment and, and the development. If you look over my shoulder, that's Paul's Bluff and that's been agricultural land for hundreds of years and now it's chopped up into numerous lots that will be sold off and that's happening all around us so you're seeing a lot of agricultural land being turned into subdivisions basically without much planning and and so if that just continues and there is room for that but if it's just continues just unabated then we're just going to be completely surrounded by more and more development and we don't have the infrastructure to to support that and it also takes away from the natural environment, which is really special here. 
You see dolphins or porpoises in the harbor, seals, bald eagles. There's all kinds of those birds that nest along the cliffs. And if all of this cliff edge becomes fortified, then that's habitat that's destroyed. So you, we have concerns about the bay. So looking forward, I want to see a community that's similar to what was there when I was a kid, but also growing and adapting in a way that is sustainable and, and, and respectful of the environment and the quality of life of residents. Well, here in our community, we're definitely seeing evidence of sea level rise and climate change related things. Three times in my life, I've seen this wharf knee deep, like completely submerged in water. And the fishermen are down here trying to keep the boats from smashing up onto the wharf. It's, it's quite a sight when that wharf is literally underwater. And I've seen that three times in my life. Um, as far as erosion, there used to be a bit of a seawall here and it broke and it, the water went right up to the street. Um, along the park and the road into town, uh, on this side, the park is disappearing at an alarming rate. It will be, it will be gone, but that's been happening for a long time too. It's just worse and worse all the time. You can, you can see foundation stones and, and old seawalls that are now 20 feet out into the water. I've seen the projections and I've seen UPEI's Clive program um, showing sea level rise. So it's a, it's a concern and we're seeing it. We're actually watching it happen. Uh, for our community, there's varying opinions on, on what to do about some of these issues and whether they're even happening. I mean, this is a place where you can really literally see it year to year, how things are changing along the coastline. And some people in the community think that this is a huge expense, and it is. But the alternative is that these houses are underwater. So perhaps it is a stopgap measure for now. And as we go forward, we need to plan. Maybe we move things. Maybe we don't put vulnerable infrastructure so close to shore. But in general, the community is supportive. It, and it's, it's such a battle for a small town to, to find funding for studies and then find funding for programs to deal with this stuff. So it's a pretty united front. Um, we just sometimes argue internally amongst ourselves about how to use the resources and where to focus our priorities. So this seawall that we placed in, in here along the shore, um, it was long overdue and it's important that it's here and it was very expensive and I'm pretty sure that it was uh, funded provincially and possibly even federally um, but it was it was such a long and difficult process to to find those funds and to get all these different levels of governance to to work together to to come up with this solution and it's the bureaucracy of it was more difficult than the laying of the rocks well victoria is um an amazing place and we don't have a large population but these people care and we work hard to to do things to better our community and one of the things that we did was to put in a uh, a water and septic system and you know the community won an award for for that system and it's been working great there have been some issues and one of the issues is that we have a lift station and a generator by the lighthouse and it's 15 feet from the shore, so that's fine today, but if the seas keep rising and we get a storm on a full moon during a high tide, then we have important infrastructure that's vulnerable to, to, to failure. And if we, worst case scenario is our, our septic system leaks into the bay which is already contaminated and that would be a disaster for the environment it would be a disaster for tourism it would just be a disaster all around so as we go forward we need to to plan where are we going to put our infrastructure and how are we going to protect it and not just for the conditions that we face today but what is the future going to be like and do we do we put important pieces of infrastructure in vulnerable areas and so and I mean, these are huge issues and complex issues, and we're a town of 120 people. And so it's a lot for us, but 
it's really amazing how this town will pull together and work together and overcome differences and, and find a good way forward. I just love this town. I grew up here and it's a beautiful, beautiful place and I wanted to I don't want it to stay the way it is, but I want it to grow in a way that honors its heritage, that preserves its environment, that looks out for the challenges that are coming our way, and also that people are able to have a high quality of life here and to, to make a living here, and that this remains a vibrant, artistic, creative community that, that is proactive. And uh, yeah, I just love it here. You should all come visit. Thank you.